Welcome to the Infill Podcast, where we interview the most interesting members of the 3D printing and maker communities live and with audience participation. And now, here is your host, Jonathan Levy. What's going on, friends? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all for tuning in and putting up with what I'm sure will be technical difficulties mostly on my side. Uh, I'm now brought to you from an Airbnb in Greece because, as you know, things have gotten a little hairy back home. So I really appreciate you all tuning in and putting up with, uh, you know, technical difficulties because we have a really, really great guest today. I actually met our guest today uh, at Form Next in China, in Shenzhen, where he and I were both guests of Any Cubics. And uh, we hit it off, started talking about 3D printing, as one does. And I discovered that he is a wealth of knowledge on a topic that I am not. Uh, there are many such topics, but his topic of choice is resin 3D printing. So it is my great, great pleasure to introduce you all to my friend, Derek Jackson of J3 De J3D Tech. There we go. Welcome, Derek. How are you? Hey, doing pretty good. Nice to be here. Awesome. And everyone, let me know uh, if our audio levels are roughly the same. People always complain that my mic is too low. Um, Derek, I would love if you could fill us in, you know, because I had the opportunity yeah. to sit with you uh, for hours and uh, eat adventurous things in China and hear your story. But I'd love if you share a little bit of your story uh, about 3D printing, how you got into it, and uh, the role that you play, because I think it's really commendable and awesome uh, what you do in and for the community. So yeah, fill, fill folks in. Yeah, so I guess where how I got into it in the first place was back in high school and like 1999. I designed this little robot in a 3D program uh, class I took back then. And then I wanted to fast forward to two years ago and a coworker brought in a resin printed mini. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I could print this robot I designed years ago. And so I sent it to him. And of course, it couldn't print because it was just terrible. And, and so I eventually ended up buying my own printer and, and really reworking this little robot um, mm -hmm. over maybe nine months of too many hours every day. Uh, and that's wow. kind of where I learned was this robot, which turned into this little miniature into this very complex, almost a jigsaw puzzle, where this robot that stands about 12 inches tall is about 250 parts. Um, everything's articulating and movable, all 3D printable with resin. So that's kind of where I learned. My intention was actually to sell the printer um, when I was done. But of course, at that time, I was kind of hooked. Uh, after that, what I started doing was kind of for the first time, I decided to go on the internet and kind of look how other people 3D printed. Uh, this is normally how I do things. I don't like to be inundated with knowledge. I like to have my own discovery. Yeah. And what I saw was kind of disheartening. I saw a lot of broken printers. I saw a lot of really kind of blown out of proportion prints and, and a lot of stuff that just wasn't really, really showcasing what these printers are, are capable of. Uh, and then I had a coworker who had the same issue. He sent me a printer he just got. He had slammed a piece of resin through it, cracked it. Oh, and so man. I started an email to him. Yeah on all my processes. And that email eventually turned into a Google document, which turned into this big, long 62 page, um, like 5,000 word guide. And then since then, I've just basically dedicated, uh, let's say two years of too many hours every day, just kind of helping people how to 3D print, how not to accidentally destroy or damage their printer. And that's, um, you know, eventually that's turned into more of a career thing, uh, where now I'm working with, with Leachy Slicer and doing the same right. thing for them, just trying to help people how to, how to 3D print and how to, how to not ruin everything. That is so cool. And as I understand it, uh, this book that you wrote is available online for free for anyone, whether or not they use Lychee. I know you've done some work for any cubic in the past before, but this is something you created for the community out of the goodness yep. of your heart, which is so cool. Yeah, I nothing, commend you for that. <laughs> nothing I ever do will be behind a paywall. Um, all the models I create are, are open for free. There's multiple calibrations or like a the, the robot that I'd spent uh, you know, seven months designing and, and a few parts of it are free, um, different calibration parts, as well as like a clap trap that I designed is up there for free, which kind of also has articulating parts and requires some high precision to get it to work. Let's see, wow. all my stuff requires high, high precision, but yeah, everything's, everything's up for free. And, and I continue to research and update, uh, as often as I Amazing. can. Amazing. And are you full-time on 3d printing stuff? I think you told me you also have a day job and this is a passion for you. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm most pretty much full time for Lychee at this point, um, awesome. and then I have some contract work on the side, um, and then you know, then I have my own business, J3 Tech, which is that educational and and just kind of content on that. So it's like having cool. uh, multiple full time jobs and <laughs> and a business as well as a, a, a family. It's just a little tough. <laughs> Uh, I can relate that that is the content creator experience, whether it's written content or it's uh, video content. It's like there's never enough hours in the day. Um, I'm curious. So it sounds like you went down the path of resin specifically because miniatures are what brought you into this. Uh, it's not actually miniatures. It's it's statues. Um, I went mm -hmm. down the path of resin because I love art. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I saw the FDM a long time ago, and for some reason that just didn't it just didn't ping me because it's it's a little ugly and it's more um i mean you can make cool stuff out of it but it definitely leans more into the uh, functional yep. type of stuff yeah and um it just didn't hit me but when i saw that resin print for the first time i was like ah okay now now i'm interested now now i've i've been peaked and it's just been kind of like a, a deep dive since then just because i love the the beauty in which you can get out of resin that you can't find out of filament yeah that is 100 percent true uh i wonder you know, the big thing for me, and, and I think a lot of, um, a lot of FDM people going over to resin is like the safety, the fume, someone already commented in the chat. They're like, I would gas myself, uh, if interesting choice of words, but if I tried mm -hmm. resin, um, how do you deal with that? Because as I understand you're working from home, you don't have a big, you know, lab. So fill me in how, how you're dealing with the safety stuff. Yeah, because you know at the time, especially I had a two-year-old, and I've got another one on the way. Um, ah, you know, it's all just in my house. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so yeah, the, the fumes can be a big deal. Um, and I'm currently finishing one of the rooms that's just right right behind me, and I'll build that out. But what I have been doing actually is I just have a spare bathroom here, and I'm in my basement. I have a spare bathroom in my basement, and of course that's sealed out um, due to code. Excuse me, due to all the code, so it's already sealed. When I finish yeah. the bathroom, I just happen to put a four-inch fan in there because I wanted it to be quieter. So that fan just vents right outside. So I leave that on 24 seven. Um, and then I bought a couple air filters that have carbon, um, activated carbon filters inside of them. And I put one of them right behind me and another one uh, in the bedrooms upstairs. And uh, we've had no, there's no issue with it, just doing that. Um, and there's some good research papers on this for resin specifically, yeah. where if you just vent outside, um, just a little bit is enough to remove almost most of it. Um, of course, when I'm in there and I'm working with it, venting is not going to get the stuff that I'm with. So right. that one, I just put on a, um, a filter with carbon activated in it. I'll replace those. I've got them on Amazon order. So they just show up about every nice. month. They're, they're pretty cheap. It's like nine, nine bucks. And of course, that's because I use it more often. If I used it less, I'd maybe stage that out. But it's about $9 a month to keep myself safe. Um, of course, then the gloves and I have an apron I put on because I got sick of ruining clothes. <laughs> yeah. So, that, that, and that apron was like five is, bucks. <laughs> I'm a little clumsy, I think. And I've gotten it. I got it on my beanie because I have the big apex maker. And so I like gently put my head in, but I didn't remember I was wearing something that made my head higher. So I got like resin on my beanie. I've gotten it on my clothes. The apron's a really smart idea. And I imagine over time, you just get much better at like not getting it right at the end of the gloves. And I mean, you're probably having a lot less print failures than I am. So you're not digging in, you know, to try and fix things, I think as much yeah. probably. <laughs> well, and there's, there's workflows. Right. And that's all in my guide as well. I actually have, so it's not just how to print, how to calibrate. I've designed my own calibration parts because I felt what was out there didn't fulfill the need. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise I wouldn't have spent time on a lot of designing, but also in my guide, I've got workflows. And so the workflows, even I've got shorts on my YouTube channel that say like, Hey, if you put a piece of tape here, you'll solve all these problems and you'll, your printer will literally last longer. But I've got workflows like making sure you use a silicone spatula to, to squeegee your FEP and to stir your resin before every print. If you do that. Ooh. You'll never have to worry about pushing a, a hard bit of resin through your LCD ever again, because before every print, you'll check it like, like, and do it like a religion, um, which means you'll have less really? filled prints. If you have a filled print, um, yeah, like that right there just solves a lot of problems. Just that I one mean, I just thing destroyed a $1,500 printer workflow. two or three, I guess, weeks ago because of that, because I was like, uh, I might have a yeah. little tiny piece in there, but it's just a tiny little piece. It'll be fine. <laughs> destroyed. I mean, it'll be fine. Punctured the FEP. And I was like, ah, the print's almost done. I'll just let it finish. Gone, dead, yeah, the killed the whole thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. these these printers are a lot more sensitive than people think. Um, yes. <laughs> they're also not as accurate as people think. So there's there's that. But just doing that, like, for an example, I have a, a FEP. It's the original mm -hmm. FEP on the original printer from two years ago. 
that has maybe three thousand dollars worth of resin printed on it wow um it's still going and that's because a couple things one i'm i'm exposing my stuff down so i'm not overexposing which will right. decrease the pull on the fat i am calibrating my z offset which is like these little things where you measure them so i make sure i'm not pushing into the fat because normally the printers will go they'll go too low and they'll put too mm -hmm. much pressure onto the fat and of course every print from then on is putting that pressure into it and yeah. so making sure that your z is actually where it should be or maybe even a little bit above will alleviate that pressure and then just doing that squeegee um because even transparent resin if you really go and 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 squeegee it you'll notice there's a little bit a little bit of change because even if there's no pigment to fall out the polymers do fall out and you do want to stir it every time but if especially if it's a, a like a very dark resin the pigments will fall out and they'll collect on the fat and yes that first layer on the build plate is the most important and if you've got a bunch of pigment there right your your bond isn't going to be as good as if you just go there so you're, you're squeezing it and that squeegee is also picking the pigment off of the fat and it's making sure there's no hard bits in there so it's it's doing a lot for you for an extra 30 seconds worth of work so just that I'm understanding, you're talking about completely wet resin. You're squeegeeing it off, emptying the entire uh, vat. No, so no. I'm misunderstanding. I'll, uh, if, if, if I can, I'll leave the vat on there for, for 10 years. Yeah, so I'll you don't take, take the off. vat out. You're um, squeegeeing it just to check that it's clean. Yeah, you'll feel it. So if you print one layer, got it. let's say you just do one layer at 30 UM, which is, you know, 0 0.03 millimeters, right? And you squeeze it, you'll feel it with your hand. Um, and in my guide at the, at the bottom, I've got links of two squeegees that I've used that, that are flat, like it's got a nice long blade on it. And that flatness helps you kind of squeegee it. But you will literally feel that in your hand, you'll feel that bump, you can even feel the tape around the LCD. that's under the fat, you like fill that and with it. So it's you're, very, you're doing the squeegee after you've already done uh, the cleaning exposure. I only do the cleaning exposure if I feel something. I'm, I, I, I squeegee it before every print. And if I do that's it, really, as that's a, like a really smart thing. As a religion, Why didn't anyone think of that? As a tick, I, I don't know. Um, and that's I a really actually smart reach out thing. to any cubic and Elegoo and I'm like, hey, you guys should include this squeegee and stop including that piece of plastic garbage. Yeah, because, because that piece of plastic I've actually punctured a FEP with that. If you get. It scratches it up. If, yeah, it scratches it up. And if you just get a tiny little bit of resin on there and it cures from heat or uv while you're cleaning your work surface or whatever game over yeah so just yeah. just that one that one workflow saves will save your printer and probably prevent your fat from from being damaged for a that's long time that's very clever and i do want to ask then, because then most then of my audience is, is uh is, is fdm people so i want to ask like if yes. someone wants to pick up resin and they're uh they're scared you know as i think they should be because you as support monkey, a mutual friend of ours told me, he's like, you really need to respect the chemistry. Like, don't come into this foolhardy. Respect, respect the chemistry. Um, you don't need to be scared, but have a healthy uh, cautiousness to you. So someone's coming in from FDM. Yeah. They're like, hey, I want to get into this. I want to do it right. How much of our, are we talking weeks to go through your guide or are we talking, you know, a Saturday afternoon? Saturday afternoon, um, because the guide is written to work you through a workflow. Yeah. So the first thing it's going to, because I don't know where people are coming in. I don't know if they've got a brand new printer or if they've had one for a while. So the guide's really going to start with like, hey, let's make sure your printer's ready. So it's yeah. going to start with squeegeeing it, doing a vat clean. This is how to do a vat clean where you use old supports to pull out the sheet so you don't dig in there. Or there's this little part oh, that's that really Thomas, smart. Uh, the never CEO knew that either. Of, like, Jesus. Created. Or if you, you could have, have saved me blood, breaking right? like three printers if I just read this guide instead of the official instructions. Yeah. And that's <laughs> at the very beginning. So like we, we, we start there, right? Start there is like, let's make sure your printer's ready. Because I wouldn't say, maybe respect the chemistry of the resin. That could be a little intimidating. And I know maybe nobody means right. by that one. But I would say respect the printer, um, respect the right. hardware, and respect that LCD surface. Uh, and so as soon as you make sure that your LCD is clean and that the, the bottom of the FEP is clean, because if that gets sticky at all, and you know it's not going to pull up from the LCD, because the way the right. FEP works, it pulls up. And if it can't pull up, you're going to have failure. So if that's clean, the bottom of the FEP is clean, and the top of the LCD is clean, you're good to go, which is keeping it clean. Um, and then the guide goes through on, OK, let's talk about settings. Let's talk about calibration. And it starts with really simple settings. And literally, it's just copy paste. Copy paste, and then print uh, this little calibration piece. And, and then mm -hmm. it tells you how to read the calibration piece. From there, it goes into more advanced settings to like keep the quality, but increase speed. 
And that's optional, yeah. right? You don't have to increase speed, but it's nice to do it without sacrificing quality. Then the guide goes into maybe a few more workflows and then it goes into more complicated stuff like how to actually support a model, uh, you know, in Lychee Slicer down to printing, which gets a little more complex, but that's more just like, there's less to do with the actual functionality of the 3D printer and more about how do you take a model and make sure it's always going to have a high chance of success right. using the slicer. It's been my experience, and I don't know if you can comment to this because you said FDM has never really spoken to you. Supporting Supports are much more difficult, and it is much more of a skill in... Uh, Either it's much more of a skill in resin than FDM or just the slicers are not as good as the FDM slicers. Because on an FDM slicer today, especially with tree supports, I mean, all of them, Cura, Prusa Slicer, Bamboo Studio, you can pretty much rely on them. Sometimes they over support things that could be bridged, right? Which I guess you don't really have in resin as much. But you're not going to get print failures because the supports are you know, for the most part, is if you use common sense. Resin is not that way. And you told me at Form Next, I said, you know, which slicer should I use if I just want to hit the automatic supports button? You're like, yeah, sorry, man. You're never going to have perfect prints if you're just using the auto supports. Do you think that will change? It, it could. Um, part of that, right, is FDM has been around a lot longer and it's also right. comes from industrial and has made its way down into the hobbyist. And resin... Right. Although it is an industrial, it's definitely probably a little bit bigger in the hobbyist and working its way up to industrial. Mm -hmm. And so there's not as much money and research into that support structure in, in the resin side of things as there is in the industrial side of things. Industrial has government contracts and aerospace, and there's literally <laughs> billions of dollars there that's going into this. And in the, this side, you know, we're, we're, we're not even close to that. But the other part about it is, is that resin has pill force. So every time you have to pull that layer off, it's yes. stuck to that FEP and that FEP has to bow up and that has to peel it off. And so those extra forces are what really changes everything. Also, it's in a liquid. And so when you're mm -hmm. in a liquid, you know, the even the liquid not settling before every print can cause things to kind of jibble around and have issues. So there's there's that kind of aspect as well. Um, as far and just to as, clarify for, for the folks in the audience yeah. who who haven't experienced with resin, you're literally talking about the fact that the print as it's printing is being pulled right? Because there's the, it's trying to pull the FEP up. There's obviously gravity as well that's pulling it, but it's literally pulling at it. And so it's, it can stretch. If it's not properly supported, you can have pieces that are stretched. And I had that on my recent helmet that I printed where it literally just tore yep. a gash in it and stretched pieces. So yep. suction cups are a problem because you're in water, you know, take, take a suction right. cup and put it on your shower wall and try to pull it off straight versus you know, get, get a knife under there and then release the suction and pull it off. The difference is, of course, one could pull the tile off the other wall and the other one just falls off. And so that's right. true. Like if you're printing something like a bowl or a cup and there's a suction cup, it's probably going to fail or it's going to rip the model in half because the forces are just massive. Um, yeah. And for many people who don't realize, but this might be a, a terrible example, we'll see. Um, the way we're talking about it, it's like if you pretend this is your FEP, which normally is transparent, and the right. LED is behind it, mm -hmm. that's shining through on your model. So your model's up here. And it is going down on the FEP and it has to pull off of it. Right. Um, and it will push down on it against the LCD and as it pulls up, as it pulls up of it, the FEP actually bends with it. Right. Which is why the it's not glass. If it was glass, it wouldn't bend and that, that's where things don't pull off. So it actually right. pulling up like this will release from the it'll release from the sides before it releases from you know the center. And, and it's actually got releases all the weight of all the resin, which varies from the beginning of the print to the end of the print, that it has to then displace when it pulls that FEP up. Which can be, yep. I mean, on the, the Apex you know, Maker, that could be four kilos of resin. You know? Yeah. And some of those bigger ones, they even perforated the build plate because the pressure of it going down to, let's say, 0 0.05 yeah. or 0 0.03 millimeters, and resin is very viscous, can right. actually crack, has actually cracked the screen. So that's why they put the, the holes in there so it doesn't put uh -huh. so much pressure on the LCD. Uh -huh. So there's, there's a lot of pressures and there's a lot of forces in resin, which is why the supports are more difficult. But right. I wouldn't say that's, there's so much stuff that's pre-supported out there. So if you're first yeah. getting into it, I think the barriers to entry to resin is more about, not even the cost of the printers, they're relatively cheap. Mm -hmm. I would say it's just the cost of the, um, you have to have a cure station. You have to be able to wash them. You're gonna want some safety equipment, some some alcohol, um, and of course the resin. But you know, if you're talking about FDM, you still have to have the material you're printing. Sure. There's a slightly larger barrier to entry to resin, yeah. but the barrier to entry doesn't have to be 
the point is, I think knowledge is actually, especially with my guide, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be the barrier to entry. The barrier to entry just be like, where can I put it? And where can I exhaust the fumes? Right. Um, and you know, where can I put the printer in the cure station? And even in my bathroom guide, idea I have, like, is brilliant, I made. by the it's way, I, we didn't get stuck on that, but the bathroom idea is brilliant. I mean, it's very smart. I was talking to uh, my interior designer the other day because she was here in Greece and we were, ta- we were talking about how things in Greece are not done to standard. Like there was a pool and on the opposite side of the column of the pool was an electrical outlet. And she was saying in Israel, these, any area with water is called a wet area translated. And it has, as you said, all these codes, it has to be sealed in a certain way. Electricity has to be done in a certain way. It has to have certain breakers like, um, you know, and obviously you're not going to get resin leaching into the walls because the walls are tiled all the way up. Very smart idea. Yep. I mean, that's easy to do as well. So when I yeah. finished my room back here, what I've, what I've done is I've actually put plastic behind all the, the, the framing and the sheetrock. Yeah. And then when I'm done with that one, there's this thing called corrugated cardboard. And it's just plastic cardboard. Right. And I'm just going to take an aluminum and I'm going to build an aluminum frame mm-hmm. and just put that on it. So I'll have a box within my room and then I'll just vent out of that. And that way Clever. I'm even more safe for the rest of my house. And that's going to be- Well, you could also do Lexan. You could do very big sheets of Lexan which you should be able to get in yeah. a post COVID world. There's some, they scaled up Lexan production yep. real big. Um, yeah. It's, and cool if you thing. get the transparent stuff, you can get light in there. Right. Uh, what's right. also nice about that one is if you do get a spill on the wall, it's plastic. So you can just wipe it off. Um, right. Really right. easy to deal with. But I'll I see a lot of individuals get like a, a grow tent. Yep. Uh, you said, you know, you need a wash and cure and all that kind of stuff. Do you, because isn't it possible you could just use a spray bottle with isopropyl? I mean, when you're getting started, brush it clean, obviously with gloves and take it out in the sun, or do you really need a wash and cure to get good prints? You don't need a wash and cure. Um, I wash my stuff in a bucket and at the bottom of my guide, I have links for all the stuff that I use. I literally, it two buckets is, is 80 bucks. Uh, yeah. And I, and I do multiple washes, so that's better. If you yeah. use the spray bottle and the brush, I don't think your prints are going to be very clean and you're not going to really okay. enjoy the results. The most expensive part about 3D printing resin is the resin, not yes. everything else. So um, make sure that you're cleaning, you're doing more than one cleaning because that'll also make your IPA last a really long time. So for example, I've got dirty IPA that I never wash. Like I just keep adding to it. There's like this thick of like dissolved resin in it and I only swish around the top and that's just to get off 90% of the resin. Then it goes in the other ones because I want those IPAs to last a long time. My That's my smart. third wash, I probably have to replace that IPA once a year, printing all the time. And then how do you cut? I mean, these and are buckets really, with really a lid, easy. obviously. Yeah, uh, I've got it all in my guide. It's what it is. It's a I use um, a food safe lid, a, a lid for food storage that has a seal on it, so that way the IPA right. can't get out of it. I've got like um, a, a basket strainer that goes inside of it so you can just lift it in and lift it out. And that's yeah, yeah. a better process because when you lift it out, if it's hollowed and hollow everything in resin because you're going to save a ton of, you're going to save weight, which is yeah, difficult on the supports. You're going to save resin, which is the most expensive thing about 3D printing and uh, peel force. So it's actually also going to save the, the support. Right. So hollow everything. But also if you hollow it, the IPA has to get inside the model and has to drain out. So the problem about a lot of the um, wash and cure stations, even the Anycubic one they just released, yep, it's not washing the inside. Even the ones you put inside of it that twirls it around, that bangs yeah. your models around and it messes them up, but also doesn't get inside of it. So I lift it out of it and then that will allow it to drain and then put it back into it. I do that 12 times for each bucket and I don't wow. have any issues with smell. Once I've cured it, things cracking, printing, anything like that. They are perfectly clean. And it's just, that's just huh. allowing it to drain. And I do it in a, in a big, in a big, um, I was going to ask why I'm sure in it. companies are throwing washing cure stations at you all the time. I was going to ask why not just get a washing cure, but you're literally saying it's actually better. I have one. I don't just do, do the bucket yeah. method. <laughs> my huh. washing cure is now a cure. Um, and I'll build my own and I'm going to build my own cure station as well because I'm not, I'm not happy with the products that exist in this market. I feel like there's too many individuals involved who don't actually 3d print, um, yeah. who are designing products for 3d printers. And so, uh, I mean, it's interesting because I'm not trying to make money off this stuff. I'm literally here just to help. And, um, but it would be interesting to look at making this version that's just, Hey, here's a, here's a quick and dirty, all the parts, all the links there, you know, you can buy them all yeah. and it's super cheap. It would be interesting to see what it would be like, well, that's what does it look like a version that you can buy. That's maybe a little more expensive, but also has some automation and some other features built in. So what I've wondered 
this is turning into Jonathan just asking his questions. So if you guys have questions, hit the comments because other people should get to ask questions too. But what I've wondered, and maybe this is just me living in Tel Aviv and having 300 days of blistering hot sun. Like if it's UV you want, isn't it just always better to take your print out in the sun and twirl it around? It'll take a while. Um, and I see some comments from, from, from 3d HP and, um, yeah, I use uh, air, air actually, I would like to use the air compressor method to blow stuff out. Um, but you want something oh, to backsplash to catch it. Um, I use a heat gun actually, um, because by the time I'm done with my final wash, that IP is perfectly clean. A heat gun gets the yeah. resin warm and it completely dries it in, in seconds. And then when I put it in the UV cure station for, so, so this into the UV cure station to answer your question, you yeah. it, the reason why you put it into a UV cure station, one, it's a lot higher, a lot uh, more UV light. It's also the right spectrum. If you're going to mm. cure with UV light, that's below the, um, the, 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 like the, the 400, you're actually going to cure a lot of the outside of it and create a harder shell, which you don't necessarily want to do. Um, also, you're getting out of the actual UV and you're getting the visible light. So the energy uh, is really terrible for the power versus uh, what you're actually going to cure it at. I so you see. want to stay within the, the UV light that they're actually putting in those UV cure stations. It's the, it's the best for penetration as well as just for cure time. That's interesting. You can cure in the sun, you'll just have to maybe sit there for a long time. But resin that's warm cures much faster. So if, you're, if your part is actually warm when you put in the cure station, you will get a much better cure on the uh, inside and the outside. But also curing the inside, um, there's a lot of mods out there for putting in a, uh, a UV light inside of it. I just have a flashlight that'll kind of shine the holes and I make sure I've got some holes that are big enough to get it in there. That's um, smart. I've never had a problem doing that. Uh, and I'm like smell cracking. I've got some prints that are quite old at this point and there's... I've never had an issue with warping, cracking, or smell. That's very smart, the idea of getting a light in. I've wondered, because I, I have every issue, like literally every issue. You, you prob probably, you could have written your, rewritten your book if you ever want to do a second edition by just watching me do one resin print. You're like, oh, that's a mistake, that's a mistake. <laughs> like, I'm that guy. Because, you know, my own, I don't have time to play with printers. FDM, I learned everything I learned before I was making content. Now it's like, okay, this week I have a few hours to play with you know, this new resin that someone sent me and I, you know, I, I have to immediately start making the content and writing a story about it, and that. recording the B roll. And so like, you know, I, I, yeah. everything I know from resin is just like on the way. Um, that's a really smart idea to get a UV light in there. Yep, yeah, it does a lot. Uh, so the kind of to answer, well, on that comment was, most of my guide was written through um, helping people on Facebook, YouTube, and, and Discord. Yep. Or not YouTube, Reddit and Discord. And so what I did is I would find someone like, you know, somebody struggling new or someone like yourself, and I would help them until I found the, the resolution to their problem. Right. And then I would go and I would test that resolution against um, as many people as I could find it with. I'd actually search out and I'd do it one at a time. So every chapter in that guide is maybe two, three months of work of testing. Wow. and helping people to resolution until I could confirm multiple printers, multiple resins, multiple environments, you know, because across the country, we've got high altitude, low altitude, people who live yeah. um, in really extreme heats, people who live in extreme cold. And so like, what is it that works for most people or everybody? Um, and so once I've got enough data, then I'll publish it. So yeah, I've, I've helped a lot of people like you and, and that's your, your, your really good uh, information. That's awesome. Yeah, it's <laughs> like the customer development uh, journey by Steve Blank. It's like find cus your customers who have an error or an issue and then solve it for them. I'm gonna ask you a hard question and then I'm gonna give you a few minutes. I, I think you'll probably have the answer off the top of your head, but I'm gonna give you a minute while I talk about today's sponsor. So the hard question is what, I, I mean, everyone, myself included, needs to read your guide. That's very clear to me. What are the three kind of really big things that you see that beginners make mistakes with that turn them off from resin 3D printing? And while you think about that, I will point out something that is not a mistake, best ad segue ever. Which best ad segue until I lost my microphone. Um, ordering from PCBWay, never a mistake. PCB Way is your one-stop shop, not just for PCBs, guys, but also for all kinds of industrial fabrication from resin 3D printing. If you don't want to get into resin 3D printing yourself, have someone else do it. Uh, from all kinds of nylon, sintering, metal 3D printing, sheet metal manufacturing, CNC machining, injection molding, sheet metal fabrication, 
they just do everything. And I got the opportunity to tour their PCB factory. And let me tell you, they are no joke. These people are putting out thousands and thousands and thousands of orders they do an incredible job with high quality parts, great service, fast shipping, great prices. PCB Way is awesome, and I want to thank them for sponsoring this channel and also video so I can pay for these expensive Airbnbs while my family and I are uh, refugees. <laughs> All right, Derek, I gave you I gave you about 90 seconds there. What are those big three uh, issues? And thanks for your patience while we pay the bills. That's, that's all good. Um, I'm a pretty honest person. I'm pretty straightforward, so I'll be honest and straightforward. Sure. The biggest issue for people getting in new is they trust the manufacturers. Mm. So they're going to look at the advertisement and they're going to look at the resin profiles and they're just going to believe that it's turnkey. They can just pour, put, plug in a setting and hit go. And that's just never true. And so they get frustrated. They'll go online, they'll go on Facebook. That's the next thing. They'll go online. And they'll listen to a lot of individuals who kind of have the same um, knowledge that they have. And when I go on there, the bad advice I see is all over the place. And it's, I hate to say that because we're talking about the community, but the community is is hardly a source for good information right. and, and a really good source for misinformation, un unfortunately. Right. Uh, and so the, and the last thing is not knowing that you have to calibrate for every resin um, at every printer and temperature is a big issue. So knowing that if you just go in there and you 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 take the time to calibrate your resin, you take the time to kind of learn a little bit about how support tips are really the size of your support tips are really important to success. Yeah. Then you're going to go from failures all the time and frustration to where um, I can go months without a failure. And I don't I'm not a great pre supporter. I just um, do it the same way every time and the same way every time works really, really well. And I get dimensionally accurate, perfect prints every time with a little bit of effort up front. That is very cool. And, and yeah, don't and trust the manufacturers. It's, they, it's a big difference, by the way, as well from some FDM. Obviously, there are some FDM printers and resins that you can't trust. But I remember getting into FDM when I first started, and I was keeping like a spreadsheet because I was like, okay, I need to figure out for each one of my filaments, you know, which temperature, and I was learning like TPU prints at this, but this speed and this, that. And then I just got a Prusa, right? Or, and this today, this could be a Bamboo, this could be a Prusa, this could be a Chidi, like any of the printers that ship with good profiles, uh, filament profiles, that is. And it's like, you don't need to mess with it. So yeah, if you're gonna buy, you know, a Creality and then you're gonna use some filament that you don't have a profile for, maybe. But in, in you can always take those Prusa profiles and be like, hey, PLA, if Prusa Mint prints at this temperature, it's probably that profile is probably going to be perfect for any PLA you pull off the shelf. Same with ABS, unless it's some kind of weird ABS tough. That is not the case with resin, right? They'll tell you like, oh, put you know, you need twelve seconds, and you're like, mm, nope, fail. Like One point eight, <laughs> yeah. Right. And you'll find that stuff all the time. Um, right. The other part is I see some comments in here um, is proper resin. So water washable resin is garbage. And a lot of yep. people will buy it because it's cheap or they think that it's environmentally different. It's not, it's got the same polymers as the other stuff. It just has, um, plant-based fillers, which make it easy to print. So like I see the comment about Sunlu, Sunlu resin is the same as, um, it's, it's, it's got a couple of brands out there that are the same resin. They put a lot of additives, um, a lot of soy additives into them, which make them peel from the FEP really, really easy. And same with water washable, they'll peel from the FEP really, really easy. So they print really easy, but. The downside of a, of a resin that, that peels off really easy is it generally is using um, poorer quality products, which mm. generally f you'll find that the issue will come later on with warping. Uh, it'll sit on the shelf and it'll warp and it'll curl or it'll crack or it won't just has long of the shelf life for some of your prints. After uh, it's And then printed. of course you get some really cheap, yeah, after it's printed. And you can, if you like cure for a long time, you'll see a warp. If you go for um, Interesting. a higher quality resin, you can get ones where the supports remove really, really easy. It's really strong. Um, it's going to last. It's not going to warp. You can print like long swords that are like paper thin and, and four inches long. And you can come back two years later and it'll still be a straight sword. Um, so there's, and that's more like not difficult, but I would say getting the proper resin is going to make a, a, such a big difference. For example, I, I test a lot of resins and I get a lot of resins sent to me. There's some resins that are really popular when I use them. I want to quit 3D printing and I know what I'm doing. 
it's not necessarily because I'm getting failures. I'm getting failures. It's just hard to clean. It's hard to get the supports off of. I'm not getting yeah. the, the accuracy and the beauty I know I'm used to getting. Um, when I use the resin that I really, you know, the ones that I've stuck to and I stuck to them because they work well, everything's just easier. And so that's part of it as well is making sure you get a, a good resin. And that's, a, that's another difference I think is with FDM, you got to try pretty hard to like get really bad materials. Like I was talking to a, a filament company today Kexeld, and we were talking about like advanced filaments and then he started talking about pla and and uh ptg and abs he's like these are commodity plastics that's what they call them internally commodity plastics like yeah. everyone's buying pla from the same company that's making the same pellets you know petg is one of the most abundant plastics or pet abs has been around for like 40 years like these things are such commodities bad filament is going to be because the pigments are bad or the spool is, you know, a mess in terms of, um, you know, the, the diameter of the film, but the actual polymers, yeah. it's pretty hard to screw up PLA or ABS or PETG. Um, th now there are some, don't get me wrong. Like I've had rolls that just don't print because it's usually when they try and do like easy ABS, let's put some additive in it to make it easier to print. Yeah, but it's pretty hard. It's water right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's probably the water washable I feel like equivalent. With, maybe it's because the chemistry is more difficult with resin. I mean, you're you're shipping something that has to be able to cure with UV light, and it's more complicated chemistry. Or maybe it's because it's newer, as you said, and there isn't as big of a budget around it. But resin quality makes a way bigger difference uh, than way, way than bigger. filament quality does. I think it seems to me from what you're saying. Well, even color. Yeah. The color. So like I can take the same resin of a color A versus color B, one of them, let's say one of them is yellow, one of them is blue. Mm -hmm. I, you, you will have to calibrate them differently because they'll need different exposure times and they're going to behave differently. Uh, you're going to notice that taking the supports off or working with them, they will be different because it's, it is chemistry and it does change it quite a bit. Right. Yeah, I never so understood like, though the, why the people buy, is, buy colored resin because can't you just put a couple drops of resin dye in and you're good to go. Like, why not just buy always white you resin? To, you you could do that, but the white there's there's other properties you get with some of the colors. Um, some Got of the it. pigments you're, you're getting aren't dyes; they're actual pigments, so they can block UV light from penetrating, which can give you a more accurate resin. Of course, the more pigment, the more brittle, the harder. So there's always like a trade-off of brittleness versus hardness. So um, I'll usually mix my resin a very very high accurate one with one that's actually a rubberized one, and I'll get a little bit of the best of both worlds. Um, so the, but it is like, I guess maybe that's back, back down to 3d monkey. It is, there is chemistry there and it right. can be very sensitive. Even the, 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 the granular consistency and size of the pigments can make a difference. So that's also a higher quality resin. So literally right. just buying a higher quality resin is, is going to, and, and the price can be similar. I mean, the Sunday resin is really, really cheap. There's a reason why it's cheap and I won't get right. into it here, but, um, what's uh, what's your recommendation I, for resins? Like what, what's your top, top three, I guess. Um, I really like the Shriotech Navy Gray. That's my favorite. Um, okay. I, I mix that with 20% uh, of the Shriotech Tenacious, which is a rubber. So the Navy Gray is very, very accurate, and the and the Tenacious is rubberized. That makes a really good mix of the two. The other yeah. one that I've been playing around with that I enjoy that's a, maybe a little bit too brittle is the um, the Frozen Aqua 8K stuff. Mm -hmm. It's very high, high, um, very high accuracy. But you'll mix that one also with the rubberized resin, and you can get a similar mix mix to the uh, tenacious one. It's just a little bit more expensive, but a little bit more accurate and a little bit more, more beautiful. So it's, you can't like play with that one. Like you could maybe the other one. So Very those, cool. those are probably my, my two favorite right now because I'm going for accuracy and, and beauty. If I wanted miniatures that were more playable, I would sacrifice a little bit of quality and instead I would go for a build resin. Um, same thing, Shritech build with 20% um, tenacious. And I'm going to okay. lose a, I'm not going to quite, quite the, yeah, that beauty and accuracy, but I'm going to have a model that you can drop and it's going to be just fine. And the reason for adding the tenacious is so it doesn't crack on the shelf or just so you can handle it and enjoy it and play with it. Yeah. Yep. Both. Yeah. It just makes it a little more, yeah. Gives it some toughness because like with resin, there's hardness, toughness, accuracy, and mm -hmm. ease of use. So if you're testing a resin and you're not testing all of these parameters, you're really not testing a resin. You're really not comparing it. And we're getting into, into the weeds here with it all, but that's, that's sure. part of what I do. So, I mean, I'll grab this little, sorry, it's not going to be the best on the camera, but part of my test is these little, these little balls. 
and it's hard to see, but they yeah, I go like that. They're printed as a single piece and, and they spin. Oh, um, cool. And uh, the 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 distance between the inner and the outer shell is one point eight millimeters. Um, point one. And so resin has to flow maybe. between it. One. Yeah, sorry, point one eight millimeters. Yeah, yeah, yeah point yeah, one eight yeah. millimeters. Um, That's a very very. So the resin has to flow tolerance. around that shell. Yeah, so it's a little bit under 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 point point two millimeters. And so of course the light bleed can light when the light cures the resin it can bleed and it causes blooming. And so um, it, a really accurate resin can hold that light in closer to the source so it doesn't bloom out as much. Because um, you know right now I can get blooming on the inner and the outer shell um, mm -hmm. to make that to make that thing come right off of it and spin like that. And so um, that's part of that's resin, but part of that's also slowing down your print speed. Um, light off delay, as it's called. So when the when the printer goes all the way down, you want to stop. And the whole point of light off delay or wait before print is so that the resin doesn't move anymore before the light isn't moving when the light turns on. That's the entire point of it. And because what you're combating mm -hmm. is, of course, that that print going down and disturbing the resin. You're also combating that a lot of these printers, and I'm going to pick on the Saturn too because it's it's the worst of them all. <laughs> is when they when it goes down, the actual build plate will bend. Ooh. Uh, depending which way you're going in the forces, it will actually bend like this, and, and the whole cover with the LCD will actually bend in. And there's some people who've done some tests on it with some more equipment than I have, accurate equipment I have access to it, but it will bend by millimeters. And so when the motor stops spinning, the printer is actually still moving for a little bit till it comes back to square. Then the resin has to stop flowing. Then you can turn on the light. If you don't do this, um, you're going to actually you're going to get a lot of blooming. You're going to lose a lot of accuracy. Yeah. And I've tested this um, with and without light off delay, high speeds, low speeds. And if I do high speed light off delay, I'm getting pretty dimensionally accurate pieces. The, the issue with yeah. high speed is you can push prints around and get more layer lines. Um, but with no light off delay, my prints consistently weigh 20% more. So if you okay. want to use 20% more resin for a, to gain a little speed and have your keys not fit in keyholes or your, right. your miniatures look like marshmallow men, use no light off delay. It's a great way to make marshmallow men. But add that to it's a lot of time because it's two seconds per layer. Um, but yeah. doing that, all of a sudden, everything just comes back to dimensionally accurate. That's kind of I'm part of the way that my here, at this point works. that light off delay and bloom went straight over my head. But I need to read the guide. Yeah, yeah. Blooming is it's just the, the light penetrates the resin and over cures. That's blooming. okay. So like okay. if you take a you know like you take the sun and you put a dark circle in front of it, you know like we just had the eclipse and the sun still shows out from the side. That's blooming. Okay. Okay. So okay. The, the light is escaping from the side, and you want to you can eliminate. You can't eliminate blooming. You can reduce it by reducing the exposure time. So how long the light has to cure resin outside of where you want it to cure. But I see. resin flowing while it's curing will get warm going over the light and cure and pillow out on every right. single layer. And that's how you get marshmallow men. Marshmallow. Um, Let me ask you this because you picked on the Saturn and I've been wanting to ask you because you're a free agent. Uh, Feel free not to answer this, of course, uh, yeah. because I know you and I both have relationships. Maybe you don't want to like shit on a brand, but what's your go-to? If someone's, I'm pretty if, <laughs> if, yeah, you're pretty honest, but also, you know, you, you got to eat and, and I know you do contract work for different companies. Not that you would be dishonest because someone's paying you, but, um, yeah. I won't ask you what printers should people stay away from. Why don't I just say, what's a good, if someone has a lower budget and if someone has a higher budget, What's, what's, what are your recommended printers? The lower budget ones, you know, the, the, um, the Elegoo, uh, Mars ones are pretty, are pretty good for, okay. for their price point. And so is the, the Elegoo or the, uh, any cubic has their six K S that's, that's a good printer for its price. Okay. Point. Uh, quite good in the higher budget. Sadly, there's, in my opinion, there's not a great printer right now in this really you know, six hundred dollar, five hundred dollars, six hundred dollar price range. Oh, I, I was going like be, if someone wants to spend thousands, because I figured you'd say four oh, hours. You don't have to spend thousands uh, here. Okay. All my stuff for my accuracy, and I'm getting point zero two millimeters on average accuracy, mm -hmm. and I'm doing it on four or five hundred dollar printers. Wow. So within okay. that four or five hundred dollar price range, that's where we're at right now. I mean, I have a couple printers that I spent twelve hundred dollars on, um, that are not near as good as my uh $400 printer. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So see, I don't it, with resin, the reason I I don't do resin reviews, I, my resin videos have been like, "Hey, I tried this printer, here was my experience." Not a review. 
Uh, and same with the Apex Maker, because I've only ever tried three printers. I can't do a review. I can just share, this is my experience as a complete beginner. If you're a complete beginner like me, here's the experience you're gonna have. And I was uh, I was impressed with the Apex Maker, but I don't trust my opinion enough. Like I feel like if, if someone more experienced like you played with it, number one, I'd trust your opinion. Maybe you'd like it, maybe you wouldn't, I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was pretty well, pretty well built. Pretty well built. So let's let's just, that's maybe an easier way to answer that question is let's talk about what I look for in a printer. Yeah, because that's a great, this knowledge, great is, question. If I, give it, if I give it another way, it's only good for today. If I give it this way, it's good forever. Sure. So um, what I look for in a new printer is, of course, there's there's user experience. So I'm going to bring up my favorite printer in the world that you can't buy right now, which is the M3 Premium. Okay. Why I love that printer so much. It's an 8K that's printer, an so it's cubic, not even right? the best on the market. 12K now. It's an 8K, yeah. They don't make okay. it anymore because it doesn't sell well, even though it's less than a year old. What makes this printer fantastic to use is it's got this really big deep vat with these highly polished walls so when you want to clean it out it's really easy to clean if you want to stir your resin these high walls keep the resin from splashing and it holds a lot of and also holds a lot of resin so if you want to do really big prints you can you don't have to keep filling um because just how much it holds is really nice it's got this um build plate that's really kind of like big i mean mm -hmm. i go grab it, but i don't want to get up in the middle of the podcast but um sure. it's got this really big build plates really easy to level and get your hand in there and actually level the thing um, it's the way that the top plate is milled. It's got this really thick tip top plate that's really sturdy. So I'm talking about the resin flexing. This this printer doesn't flex at all. So things you want to keep in mind of is, does it have a good Z screw? Is it is a high quality, nice, thick and bulky? Does it have a good rails, nice, nice high quality rails? Is that top plate nice and thick so the resin the printer won't actually bend? Mm. Uh, Elegoo has those ball joints that move around a lot. Is it a four four point joint? Um, the Saturn Three Ultra, which I, I like that printer. I, I bought it myself and did a review on it. Um, it's on my YouTube channel. What I don't like about that printer is the way they did the, the mounting for the build plate. I can't get my fingers in there to level the, the dang thing. So I had to build this tool. Um, it's got this really short vat that's hard to use with these tiny screws that strip really easy. And where the, where the M3 Premium has got these big fat screws, you'll never strip them. They, they bolt down really nice and tight. Um, so I'm I looking see. for things like that. I'm looking for a printer that's solid. But what's more important than um, resolution, so that 8K printer prints way higher quality than a 12K printer. Right. Why? Because of light source. The light engine is way more important than resolution. In fact, I've got a 6K printer that prints better than than a current 12K printer that I've been Okay, because I was going to say, I'm surprised um, you're talking about all mechanical, but now you're getting into light source. Yeah. So how do I know if I have a good light, light engine? Source. A good light engine is, isn't going to be what they call the dot matrix, which is a bunch of LEDs lined up and a, yeah. and a lens. Those are those. The, if it has the friends of lens, it's a little bit better. But if it doesn't, you know, if it's not doing that one, it's just using the, the pillow lenses. And you'll see it when you look down, you actually see like this grid. That's the yep. worst type. Right. The better type is actually a single light source that goes through a mirror. And that mirror will reflect it back out. These printers are going to be taller, so they'll take up more room because it takes yes. time for that light to reflect up. But literally space makes light go straight. So the further right. away the light is from the LCD, the more time it has to go straight. But all, that's why it reflects like that. Um, and the more direct it can get. When your sources are crushed down like this one, you're going to get more scattering. It's like the difference between your hose on, you know, spray mode and and, and stream mode. It's it's going to that's that's what it is, and that's actually going to be a big part of accuracy. The next thing is how the LCD is actually mounted to the build plate. This is a big thing to look for. Um, in the in the M3 Premium, they actually milled out a place for the tape and the LCD to sit down, so it's all flat and flush. In let's say the Saturn 3 Ultra, a printer that costs just as much money, it's not. The tape sits above it, and the LCD sits a little bit above it. So when I put the FEP down, you actually look at the corners of the FEP, and you can see it's actually pushing up on the FEP. This is going to create for a, a less consistent pull, and the yep. further away you are from the LCD, the less in focus you are. It's like a projector out of focus. The further away right. you get, the the less in focus. So the more you can get your FEP to the LCD, the much higher uh, resolution you'll get. And the more material you have to go through. So like if I'm throwing on those um, screen protectors that cover the entire top of the printer, I'm actually, that's material and that space and I'm losing accuracy. So that 12K screen or we're going to get 16K soon, it starts to mean nothing because you've deleted all that resolution in, in bad light source or um, a bad top plate of the printer or a bunch of screen protectors or this ACF film that they're coming with, which is really thick and it's textured and it's milky. So it's like all the things that make resolution go away, it's like putting Vaseline, you know, over it. It's it's terrible. Yeah. For, so for ACF quality, is, right? Good is for speed, not but... the same as NFEP, right? That's something different. Or is it the same? 
Correct. Yep. They're okay. different. We used to have FEP, which is who cares anymore? It's old. And FEP is now the, the new normal. It's just slightly better FEP. Um, and now we have ACF film. ACF film has a physical texture to it. It's made of a slightly different material. It's more rubbery. And yeah. what it does, it actually lifts up easier. And so uh -huh. it, there's a section cut between the bottom of the FEP and the LCD. And so making sure that's uh -huh. dry and clean will also increase it. But it has to do this while the print is also has to do the same thing. So if this gets stuck to the LCD, it won't lift up. So it's got a texture on the bottom that helps it release easier. So you can pull up really quick and it's got less it. force on the support. So you could print faster. And that's the point of it. It does this by adding a texture to the bottom, which of course okay. texture causes light diffusion um, and also prints a pattern. So your prints will actually have like a, a texture on the outside that you can feel and see. Some people don't mind it. I personally think it, it well, it destroys accuracy and I don't like the look of it personally. So that's what's shipping on all these fast printers is uh, ACF, not NFEP. Correct. It's weird because they're doing 12K screens and we're throwing NFEP on it. You're like, the, the higher the resolution of the screen, by the way, the, the less light that gets through. So the longer exposure times you need. So if they're going for speed, I would think that they would actually go down from an 8K to like a 6K or a 7K or just 8, 8K because that would actually increase the speed. You're not getting accuracy anyway. So it's a really weird business decision. So when I said earlier, don't trust the manufacturers, that feels like a bunch of people who don't 3D print making stuff for 3D printers. It's stuff like this that, that I just don't understand. Yeah. So I bought the Saturn well, 3 Ultra because it has a right? good light engine. It build quality is high. Yeah, and I it's, replaced it's, the ACF film with NFEP. It's the same thing as Creality saying the K1 Max, which we're talking about in the comments here. Uh, it it prints 600 millimeters per second. Like no, it doesn't. Okay, it's, you're never going to print that speed. It's not going to happen. But it sounds faster as a potential top speed than 500, which is what the bamboo can do. And there is a segment of customers who are going to say 12K is more than 8K and it's almost the same price. So I'm just going to buy the 12K. Um, you know, it, it's, I don't want to say it's taking advantage of the uneducated buyer, but there are people who buy a computer based on its specs. You know, it has 32 gigs of RAM. It's like, you're never going to yeah. use that. And this particular operating system is really ineffective at using RAM. You'd be better with, you know, a Mac that uses half as much RAM, but whatever. Um, I'm sure I'm going to get yeah, a lot of hate it's, comments I would say for that. that. It's, it's marketing terms, right? Right. And right. Mar marketing uh, works. Yeah. And speed and stats work. Totally. But what? Totally. So the part of my review, I bought a Saturn 3 Ultra, not because I want one. I do not want a Saturn 3 Ultra. Um, I don't even use it. I put it in storage after I did my review. Mm -hmm. I went out and bought that. And I don't make money off of any of the stuff I do, by the way. For like our YouTube and stuff, it's all non-monetized. Um, I bought that printer because I want to help educate the individual, the, the community. I want the entire community to become smarter about this. And I want them to say, we don't want gimmicks. We're not going to, we're not going to pay attention to your, to your fast or your high, you know, pixel density. What we're going to pay attention to is build quality. And the right. Saturn 3 Ultra is a printer like the M3 premium that said, we're going to make a version that's build quality. So the Saturn 3 versus the Saturn 3 Ultra is Saturn 3 Ultra has a higher quality screw, higher quality rails, more metal better light engine that's mm -hmm. mostly it and it went from the ball mount, mount to a four post mount it's an extra hundred dollars but the extra hundred dollars went to purely build quality and for some reason they threw an acf film on it because marketing said we got to have speed or it won't sell so you right. replace that acf with an nfap and you have what yourself in a solid printer and so i want to promote that i want to tell people hey look at these pay attention to these stats not these stats unless if we all buy the printers that are based on build quality instead of fancy, stupid features, what we will see is the industry trend, which is currently moving towards these cheap plastic light printers, low quality, which you want to talk about, I think what's going to be barrier to entry to people getting the 3D printing, cheap printers that don't work well, yeah. um, with, this with, the Ender with 3 dumb curse. marketing features. How many people yeah. bought Ender that, 3 That's what's happening go, for me. right now. Yeah. But if we can educate the, the world and say, pay attention to quality, buy those printers, let the other ones sit on the shelves, then the entire industry as a whole will will pivot back to high quality printers that are much easier to use, last longer, and get better quality versus these stupid gimmick features. Yeah, it's the race to the bottom that we've seen in FDM and it's just now pulling back up. Like just now companies are going, uh, we, we probably need to do something a little bit different. Um, we might be three or four generations behind you. We're, we're, we're literally going like this right just now. Just hitting it. Oh, I know, we're, we're, I, I got it. just started the race to the bottom. I won't say the company name because I don't know if there's an embargo on the product. I said no, but they're like, we have a $99 resin printer. I was like, nope, no, thank you. Don't want that. I'm good. I'm good on the $99 resin printer. Like, it's just going to be, 
I, maybe it's great, but it's 70% chance it's just going to be such a hassle, you know? It, especially it's like one of the hands. things like, will it print? You're like, yes. <laughs> it, it, it will prints. print. It's like it one of those printers. Pr um, <laughs> let's see. I want to open up to the audience. We're running up on time here. Um, but for folks... Uh, for folks who want to ask questions, please feel free. I'm, I'm just reading the comments here to see if I missed any. Where can people check you out and where can they find this amazing guide? Um, it's So the guide's going to be republished here soonish. Um, it's, that's been saying for a long time. Uh, there's reasons why it's still in Google Doc because it's not a website and I won't get into that either. Um, but right now it's just a Google Doc. So the best thing to do is just Google search J3D Tech and you will find uh, links to the guide through there. Of course, my, my YouTube channel, I've got a link to um, both all of my calibration prints and to my guide and all of my YouTube channels. So it's probably the best place because even most of the videos there are about education and aren't about, um, there's a few there that are just kind of entertaining, but most of them they're about education. So uh, even the shorts are, are about trying to teach us something like a little tip or a trick and the, awesome. the, the links and, and all those. So go there. Awesome. Amazing. And what's, uh, what's, okay, a few questions here my closing questions while we wait for some questions. What's the next big thing you're excited about in 3D printing, which I hope we'll get a new answer because you're the first kind of heavily resin person we've had on the show. Yeah, um, I think for resin, there's, I would love to see technology um, pivot a little bit away from current LCD or laser. And it's mm -hmm. kind of funny because I had the idea like a week ago and I talked to some people about it and apparently someone's already doing it as a Kickstarter, but the idea of where you can use um, an LCD to cure the inside of a model and a laser to cure the outside. So that way we can get like the same quality of laser, but the speed of, of, um, of uh, LCD. That technology that's coming out is pretty exciting to me, but also I'm just excited to see as this technology moves forward, if we do start to see a shift towards very high quality um, printers that feel like they belong in the industrial world, Yep. but down onto the desktop. I'd like to see disruptive. Um, there's a few individuals that are trying that as well, trying to disrupt the um, high-end high manufacturing market with desktop printers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see that disruption happen because that's going to pull a lot of technology down towards the hobbyist as well and make it more accessible. Yes. I have a buddy in this mastermind that I'm in who who's, who's very serious about resin 3D printing, has a big presence. I won't say who it is, but... Uh, he mentioned to all of us, he's like, if you want to get into resin printing and you have the budget, Form Labs, I think it's the, f maybe not the Form one. I'm probably confusing. Their latest, greatest new printer, which is like accessible to consumers, but is an industrial machine. I think he spent like $2,500 just on the printer. But he was like, when this trickles down to consumer, resin is going to be so much more approachable. It's such a high quality machine. Like, So he was raving about that. I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about um, when I interviewed Dr. O Oyang from Anycubic, he said, there's a potential future. I don't know if you agree with this. There's a potential future where it's all just integrated into one printer. It's the printer, it's the wash, it's the cure. You just set it and forget it. And it's, it's possible. It's just a matter of moving the resin out, washing it. It's obviously not going to wash it as well as you wash it, Derek, but... I'm excited about that too. Not having to like put on gloves and play with the resin is a really exciting um, future for me. Form Labs, that's a terrible, I would never, I would, I would have a hard you time endorsing like a product like that because any spill or anything like that and the resin gets anywhere, you're, you're screwed. Cured resin uh, is impossible to remove from surfaces. Right. So um, I don't even like the washing cures that try to combine curing and washing in the same step like the one Anycubic did right. because you're always going to have issues with gumming, gumming up. You should, those should be separated out. But um, okay. Form Labs does have a machine that will remove it and dump it into a basket, which point you can then take it and put it into the wash and cure in a wash station. Um, that does cool. remove at least the interacting with the print from getting it from the build plate. They've got some cool technology that I would like to see into the uh, industrial, into the, I've, I gave all this to Anycubic. Um, and so they get it for free and I've, I've offered it to Elegoo and stuff like that. So we'll see. But what, what we need in, in resin some of these little tiny things that make a big difference. So for example, they've got a squeegee built into the, into the bat and it goes at every layer. So if that thing hits something and it, and it falls off a magnetic rail, it automatically tells the printer print fail. It also squeegees it, which keeps your resin mixed. Wait that, a minute. Every you layer. All the time, your resin stays mixed all the time. That's crazy. We, every single layer. We have layer. Wi-Fi enabled printers. 
that you don't know if you've got something in there before you hit print. But what if something would do a squeegee and tell you, oh, wait, failed, you've got something in it, go check it before it'll-, it'll How does it know if something print failed? Print. Because it, the squeegee uh, is- A magnetic track that'll, that'll drop off and then it knows it just lost it. Super simple, right? The, the, the magnet nice. loses connectivity, it triggers a, 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 a sensor and voila, fail. Go, go Shit, that's print. really smart and super um, easy and cheap. Yeah, and, and putting a vat heater into the vat as well, that makes a huge difference. Warm resin versus yeah. cold resin is yeah. leagues ahead as far as quality and, and printability. Um, so little things like that, um, a, a, a build plate, which these auto level things don't work, but something where you could actually like turn the knob one way and you push down and it puts equal pressure on the, on the build plate. So leveling is just like this and then you tighten it, you know, so you don't have to mm -hmm. do all this weird stuff with paper and all this stupid crap. Um, I would like to see resin printers start going the way of FDM where they stop controlling the firmware. Cause what happens in resin, I actually tell the printer to do this particular thing and the firmware, the printer will be like, nah, I'm doing this instead. And yeah. it's different. And so the most part, you don't have to worry about it. Like that's not a barrier to entry, but it's just, they need to open it up more to the slicers. Um, right. Someone asked about the, the, the uniformation, uh, GK2. That's not a bad printer. I would say for its price point, it's a little bit interesting um, because it's not the best printer out there. Um, as far as quality, it's got some weird bugs in it as well. So it's got the, the heater, but it's built in as not a vat heater. And the heater can cause some vibration, which causes some layer lines. It's got this really tiny screw that though it's a high quality screw, it's not going to be as powerful and as strong. Um, mm. Overall, it's a good printer with just a few issues that make the price point interesting, in, in my opinion, um, for that $1,200, $1,300 price point for that printer, where I could get better prints um, with less weird gimmicks from half the price of that guy. So that's that's my take on that one, um, the uniform. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I don't see that we have any more questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just answering. How much time left we got? I mean, we can go for as long as you want. Um, but well, I've got one more one more thing I'd like to I'd like to talk about if we get if people are interested. And that is it's hard to tell, but that's this thing. And I don't know if I can show my screen or not, you know, and stuff like that. But this is you can my calibration print that I designed boxes of calibration. Okay. Um, tell us more. I probably should have sent you a link. So why, like, this is what I designed because I felt like there wasn't anything on the market. So part of the barrier to entry to 3D printing is calibration. Uh, back to your previous question. And the issue right now is most of these, most calibration prints on the market are what we call dimensional accuracy. So what you tell the printer to print is what you get. It's, we're all used to that, right? This is, yeah. this is additive manufacturing we're talking about. And accuracy is a part of manufacturing across the board. Um, the problem is, is they're flat. And, and when you print in resin next to the bill plate, you're going to do a long exposure time. So it's called, that's the blooming conversation. And right. that those first layers are going to be massively overexposed, which is fine. They have to be, which there's no detail. It's, it's a hard cure. It's awful, but it's what it is. And normally those are absorbed in a raft and then you've got supports, and then you have your models. So there's plenty of space. Um, the other part about it is, is that these printers are relatively cheap. So when they, when the bill plate goes down, it hits a sensor. And then it goes up and then it, that sensor, it sets, oh, that's zero. And then it'll go down and it starts to print. Well, that right. sensor isn't the most precise thing in the world. So sometimes it's a little low, sometimes it's a little high, you know, by a little bit. And so you get what's called layer crushing. And so these flat calibrations can sometimes be a little more flat, a little more thicker than they should be. And that affects, that affects your, your, your end result in your reading. The next thing about them is they're visual. You have to look at them and say, can I visually see the difference between 0.1 millimeters? And for most people, you can't, it's just tiny. And so you're trying to look at it, you know, and gauge it and they're not good. So what I designed is a calibration part that gets you dimensionally accurate without any of those problems. It's, it's taller, again, hard to see. Yeah. Um, so it's got a wrap that absorbs the burn in layers. It's got height to it. So all that's absorbed, but the way it is, is there's these three boxes, you snap them off and you stack them inside of each other. If the boxes stack and they fit snug, you're within 0 0.02 millimeters of accuracy. There's wow. no guessing you are, or you aren't, if they wiggle, increase your exposure time. If they're too tight, decrease your exposure time until they fit. Very clever. So that by itself is, is easy, but also now let's talk about problem number two with resin printing. Um, and I'm the only person to solve this one as far as I'm aware, and I've looked. If you just calibrate exposure time, there's a good chance your resin won't be exposed enough to have good strength in your supports, which means you'll get failures. Yep. So That's you've me. seen 
other calibration prints exist that are like stress tests. So they're like, oh, calibrate until these things pass. And who cares about accuracy? Um, we're just going to expose until we get strength. Right. And the problem with that one is you'll get high success, but you'll, you know, you, who knows where you'll be for accuracy. So the way these boxes of calibration work is I can go in there and print really fast and I can reduce my exposure time until the boxes fit. I'm dimensionally accurate, but my prints will fail. Um, there's also, then that's where these little things on this, you can't see them in the video, but if you look up on the guide, you'll see these are, they're pillars and the pillars start from 0.1 millimeters and go up by 0.2 across. So if you've got no pillars that print, but your boxes fit, you're dimensionally accurate, but you have a terrible calibration method. And this is the calibration method that all those flat pieces tell you to print all of them. Uh -huh. So it makes sense why people designed other calibration methods for stress testing is because it's awful. So what this one does is if you add light off delay or you slow down your printer, your boxes will actually get smaller, which means you'll have to add back in exposure time. So now you can get all of these pins to print and the boxes will fit. So now you have tensile, tensile strength and dimensional accuracy at the same time. And that's what the calibration print gets you to do. At that point, there's no need for anything else. You've got- So this is kind of, you're print. recommended for every resin that you purchase or every resin you try, this is the first thing you do. Yes, and I've tested, um, I intentionally have a lot of printers from different manufacturers of 4K, 8K, 12K, um, you know, Elgu. Um, well, I've got eight different manufacturers now yeah. and I'm intentionally, I'm choosing different manufacturers. I've got resins from everyone and I buy specialty resins like these ones that are like $80 or $200 a bottle. Um, they're like purely rubber or like Mecca white, which is really hard to print or wax resin and um, everything in between. And so I'm testing these on all of resins, all of these printers so that I can make sure that they work. Of course, now I've, they've been public for a while. So I've got people sending me pictures all across the board where at first I didn't have enough data to say that going from one second to two second light off delay changes dramatically the accuracy of your prints. Now I can say with certainty that it does because I've had a thousand or 2000 people do it and give me the, the, the measurements and say, right. this makes, this will increase accuracy. So with the data I've gotten, I've actually created a profile. It's kind of like the one profile for most printers. And it's the one that I, I publish everywhere. It's basically saying, if you just put in these settings and, and these settings have been curated over a lot of research and a lot of feedback, and then all you have to do is, is calibrate for exposure time, you're pretty much going to be there for almost all resins, all printers. That's amazing. Without, without having to really guess anymore. Cause guess I was gonna ask been, you, been, I mean, I assume different removed. light engines make a huge difference different FEP or NFEP. So that's crazy that you've got kind of one universal and then you have one parameter that you just need to tweak. Yep. Um, and it's just exposure uh, time. Burn-in layer exposure time and normal layer exposure time. Burn-in you have to do by fill. It's just like how hard are they to remove? Yeah, So I've noticed that. That's just print some things and find out. Um, but for the, um, for the normal exposure, that's just this. You print this, you get all the pillars, the boxes fit, you save that and you have, what you should have is confidence. So if you get failures at that point, instead of you going around and fudging with numbers, which I see all the time, do I change this? Do I right. change that? You have confidence in your calibration because you know what's good. Now you like, well, what what else could it be? It must and then be the bottom supports, of my guide, I also have all the causes for failures. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's something else. And and, and you, you've eliminated a variable and it makes it really easy to troubleshoot. And confidence is the most important thing to sure. maintaining success. I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's industry. okay to have failures, but when you have a failure and you have no freaking idea why it's failing, that's when people get frustrated. And that's when yep. they go to the message boards and that's when they get the wrong information and that's when they go down a rabbit hole of errors. I see it all the time. Yeah. yeah. And, and part of that is also the thought process. So even in my guide, I try to correct some thought process. So for example, I hear all the time is the FEP, the, the print stuck to the FEP. Um, or everything's sticking, you know, sticking to the FEP. And I'm like, don't, don't, don't think of it that way. Right. Nothing stuck to the FEP. Something failed. Right. What failed? Was it the raft that failed to failed to hold on to the bill plate? Was it the supports that that failed to hold on to the print? Or did the print rip in half and fail to print fully? Right. Because these things have different causes, and I have that all listed in the guide as well, where I actually use this language and this terminology to try to help to think about it in terms of not just everything stuck to the FEP, but what what particular thing failed so you can pinpoint it and quickly find the resolution. That is very smart. Derek, I wanna thank you so much for uh, not just this interview, but also for everything you do for the community, all free of charge, which is amazing to me. And you're a, you're a huge 
uh, asset to the community. I'm going to put all your links in the description. I want to encourage people to check them out. Or if you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, uh, we'll put it in the show notes. Derek, thanks so much for tuning in. And thanks to everyone who tuned in live today. All right. Thank you for having me. Have a good one. And I'll take us out. Thanks for tuning in to the Infill Podcast. For show notes or links to anything mentioned in today's episode, visit thenextlayer.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to leave us a review wherever you're listening or click the like button to let us know and consider subscribing to The Next Layer on YouTube so you can tune in live and participate in the next conversation. We'll see you on The Next Layer.